after the Indonesian elections. Uh, we've been doing a series here on elections and democracy in Southeast Asia. We did one on the Thailand elections uh, a, a few weeks ago. Uh, today we're going to talk about Indonesia, and we will be looking at the one-year anniversary of the Malaysian elections on, on May 9th. We'll hold another event, and uh, we'll probably do something on the Philippines as well. Uh, a lot of interesting change uh, and continuity uh, on the electoral side in Southeast Asia these days, um, and a lot to talk about. Of course, yesterday was the big election in Indonesia, um, and the results were pretty much as expected. Uh, Joko, Joko Widodo won re-election by a fairly comfortable margin. Uh, President Jokowi, as, as he is called, uh, ran with Maruf um, um, Amun, and they won about 55% of the vote. Of course, these are not official results. These are unofficial tallies at this point. Um, and his opponent, Prabowo, uh, was about nine, maybe 10 points behind. Um, so this is a, a, an important and interesting uh, time for Indonesia, the uh, re-election of President Jokowi, who's the first president who came from the non-elite, non-military background. Um, and it's also important to point out that these elections in Indonesia are a massive undertaking given that Indonesia is such a large country. Uh, there are, are close to 200 million registered voters that went to uh, uh, 800 million polling stations around uh, all over, uh, 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 in, excuse me, 800,000 polling stations all over uh, the Indonesian archipelago. Um, so it was, a, it, was, it was parliamentary and local elections as well, not just uh, a presidential election. So we have a lot to talk about, uh, the results of the election and the implications for Indonesia and perhaps more broadly, Indonesia's foreign policy and what it might mean for regional dynamics as well. Uh, I have a terrific panel to discuss this, uh, two real experts on Indonesia and Indonesian politics. First uh, to my left is Dr. Anne-Marie Murphy. Uh, she's a professor at Seton Hall University at the School of Diplomacy and International Relations. She's also taught at Columbia University and Barnard College, and she is also currently a senior research scholar at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia Interview University, um, where she chairs the university seminar on contemporary Southeast Asia. And she's also been a visiting scholar to the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Jakarta, not us, not our CSIS, but another CSIS. That's a good friend of ours, although we're not related. Um, and uh, the Institute of Security and International Studies in Bangkok. And after uh, Anne-Marie talks, we'll turn to Adam Schwartz, who's founder and chief executive officer of Asia Group Advisors, where he counsels senior executives on business opportunities in Southeast Asia, uh, and on Southeast Asia markets, and how to effectively manage political, economic, and security risks. And Adam has been based in Southeast Asia since 1987. Uh, and is a very well-networked and well-known figure out there as well as here. So with that, let me turn to Anne-Marie. Okay, well, thank you very much, Amy, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. Um, I must open this up by saying that although I have observed Indonesian elections, both formally and informally in the past, I have not been there during the campaign period, so I am channeling um, a lot of the views of my friends and colleagues who are there on the ground, um, and where appropriate, I will certainly tell you whose wise views I am uh, channeling. Um, so as, and I hope I've got this right, because I can't see it. Um, sorry. As Amy indicated, uh, these elections were the largest single day elections anywhere in the world in terms of scope. I have the figures out there uh, in terms of the number of uh, seats at stake both at the national and at the local levels. This is the first time that Indonesia has held simultaneous elections for both the president uh, and parliamentary elections in the past. The, pres the, excuse me, the parliamentary elections would be held in June and the presidential ones would be held in July with a runoff later if needed. And the reason that they traditionally did that was because according to Indonesian election law, in order to nominate a presidential candidate, um, the parties need either 20% of the vote or a coalition of 25% to nominate a candidate. Therefore, 
um, you would have the parliamentary elections first. What happened in the past, though, was that after the parliamentary elections, you'd have all of this horse trading back and forth uh, to determine slates, uh, which parties would ally, who'd get the top spot, second spot. And in order to um, reduce that, they decided to hold all of the elections on one day, and the president's uh, candidate slates were announced eight months ago. It also significantly uh, reduces costs. Um, so as Amy indicated, the, um, the big news is that President Joko we won. I'll talk about the campaign issues in a little bit. Uh, Adam's gonna talk about the parliamentary results. I just wanna flag that there was a lot of expectations that holding the parliamentary and presidential elections uh, on the same day would produce coattails for members of PDIP, Joko Ruiz Party, Gorinda Prabowo's, um, and that does appear um, to have been the case. Um, Joko Ruiz did one with, win, excuse me, with approximately uh, 55 or so percent of the vote to about 45 percent. These are based on quick counts. Quick counts are not exit surveys. They are actual counts of votes um, at the polling place. So they are real votes, have been very reliable in the past. Joko, we had hoped to get over 60% of the vote in mm -hmm. order to match um, SBY's resounding uh, mm -hmm. re-election, um, and he fell far short of that. So yes, he won, but certainly not by the margin that he and his allies were um, hoping to win. Um, so when we look at the campaign, um, Joko, we ran on a platform similar in some regards to that that he did in 2014, portraying himself as an effective government reformer who had delivered on his key campaign pledges uh, in 2014, which were A, to expand and enhance social welfare programs, particularly health and education, his infrastructure drive, which is focused not only on major ports, bridges, et cetera, but also bringing roads to many rural communities and portraying himself as a simple man of the people, mm -hmm. as um, Amy indicated, the first president from a non-elite background whose rise to political prominence was made possible by direct local elections um, at the uh, gubernatorial uh, level in Solo. So I want to point out that 70% of the Indonesian populace, according to public opinion polls, does indeed approve of Joko Wee's performance in office. The same opinion polls, however, show that only 50% of the respondents intended to vote for Jokowi. Why? Because he was not seen as sufficiently Islamic enough. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, on the other hand, Prabowo uh, resurrected many of the right-wing uh, populist, nationalist, hardline Islamist uh, themes of his last campaign. He rallied against elites, even though he, of course, is one himself. He rallied against foreigners who he blamed for um, exploiting Indonesian resources. Um, and he had the support of hardline um, Islamic conservative elements, obviously despite the fact that his mother and his siblings are Chinese, or sorry, are Christian. Um, and he also criticized uh, Joko Wi for leaving Indonesia extremely weak militarily, claiming that he would significantly boost defense spending. And most critically for those of us interested in democracy, Prabowo made no um, attempt to hide the fact that he clearly sought to return Indonesia to a much more authoritarian system. He wanted to abolish local elections, uh, restore Indonesia's 1945 constitution, which does away with direct elections for the president, um, and roll back other democratic reforms. And there's an interesting point here that although opinion polls consistently show that Indonesians have strong support for democracy, it also shows significant nostalgia for the Suharto era stability. Um, so that this was a theme that Prabowo could tap into. Um, so clearly, given these campaign agendas, uh, Jokowi's win is a clear victory for democracy and good governance. 
At the same time, however, I think it's important to note that there were three key trends um, during the election that uh, do not bode well for that. Um, the first one is the rise of um, Islamic majoritarianism. Uh, I want this one okay. just for a minute. Yep. I'm sorry, I can't see what's up there. And these <laughs> lights are blinding. So if I look a little bit like a deer in a headlight, it's, uh, it's, this, it's, a, it's this environment. Um, I just want to put it up here because there's three key themes, right? Uh, the rise of Islamic majoritism, the increase in money politics, and the use uh, by Jokowi of the state security apparatus against his political opponents. And when you look at the two VPs here, um, they each embody one of them, right? Mm. Maurif Amin, um, the conservative former head of MU, head of the uh, Indonesian Council of Ulamas, was picked as the VP candidate uh, in order to shield Jokowi from those uh, critiques that he was not sufficiently uh, Islamic. On the other hand, Santiago Unus, or known as Sandy, he is a very wealthy uh, Indonesian entrepreneur who was chosen for the um, financial contributions that he could bring to Prabowo's campaign. So again, two kind of weaknesses in Indonesia's uh, election and politics that we see embodied in the VP candidates. So now I'll go to that next slide. Um, on the rise of uh, Muslim majoritarianism. And here I direct your attention to a really important um, report by Sydney Jones of the Institute for the Policy Analysis of Conflict, where she's really traced this in some good, uh, fantastic detail. Um, arguably the most significant socio-political uh, change in Indonesia over the last 20 years of the democratic era is this rise of um, kind of a right-wing Islamic populism. We all saw this uh, demonstrated most vividly uh, in um, 2016 uh, when the demonstrations by what became uh, known as the 212 movement, right, because it happened in December 2nd uh, against the Chinese Christian governor uh, of Jakarta, Ahok, who had been a uh, key Jokowi ally um, that ultimately led to Ahok's conviction and imprisonment on blasphemy charges for telling his Muslim constituencies that the Quran did not prohibit them from voting for non-Muslims. Um, so this movement in 2016 really inflamed um, religious intolerance and Islamism. So in a survey that um, I have the statistics up there that Marcus Metzner and some of his colleagues did. They showed that in 2016, 42.3% of Muslims objected to non-Muslims holding office. By 2018, that number had risen to 54.5 or 6%, okay? So that you see this dramatic rise in Islamic majoritarianism. Now clearly, this 212 movement is not monolithic. It's divided on a number of key issues, but key principles that they would all agree to are this kind of opposition to pluralism, secularism, liberalism, um, this sense given uh, rising income inequality in Indonesia, that if the Muslims are 90% of the population, they should have 90% of the jobs, uh, and that the state should protect Islam, okay? So if this is a key trend, how does Joko Wee, who has traditionally portrayed himself, and, and indeed Ben, um, a pluralist and a key promoter of um, a tolerant, inclusive Indonesian society, uh, react? So on the one hand, he obviously chose Maruf as his VP. And I think it's important to note that he did this besides the fact that Maruf Amin, as head of the Council of Ulamas, was the one who issued the fatwa against his ally Ahok, stating mm -hmm. that Ahok had indeed committed blasphemy. And this laid the groundwork for his conviction. Mm -hmm. So how did Maruf become VP? Jokowi certainly didn't want him. He had another candidate, the former um, 
chief uh, judge of the Constitutional Court, who until the announcement of Maruf was still expecting um, the nomination. However, two key parties in Jokowi's coalition, the two religious parties, the PKB, which is allied with Nahadulu Lama, um, the largest Indonesian Muslim social organization, about 40 million people, strong in Java, um, committed to a much more tolerant, um, multi-confessional Indonesia. They threatened to walk away from Jokowi if he didn't give the VP slot to Marif or one of those. And this threat was credible, not so much because all of their supporters would vote for Prabowo, but because, as I indicated earlier, Indonesian election law requires that candidates have the support of either 20% of, or your party have 20% or a coalition of parties that have 25% of the vote in the last election. That means that had these two parties defected from Jokowi, they could have formed a coalition and run a third candidate. And it was that threat that really led Jokowi to um, accede to this uh, nomination by um, Maruf. So, um, that, that was one way in which he has responded to this. Okay, I need to be on my next slide now, <laughs> all right? How has Joko we responded to this? Uh, do I have that right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the second, of course, is that he has given huge amounts of patronage to the Nahadulu Lama. Um, he has used state funds to give their pasantran money for women's programs, job training programs, all of these different things to uh, enhance their mission. Um, and obviously there's a, an ex expectation that more of this will flow. Um, so on the one hand, this really shored up support um, for Jokowi by and ooh, but it also triggered um, resentment among uh, Muhammadiyah, the other ma large um, Islamic organization, who is also fighting intolerance. Yes, like Anu has conservative and more liberal wings, um, but is very disappointed to see that to fight against the more conservatives, Jokowi is only turning to one group and is using religion to combat religion, which of course is leading to more polarization. And so what you have seen is that a key, at least from reports on the ground from people like um, Ed Aspinall and others, that the key to victory for Jokowi was the mobilization on the ground by NU, uh, particularly in the strongholds in Java. There's some estimates that that amounted to about six million votes that could have been um, the margin of victory. And I want to point out that this, um, the tenor of the rhetoric has gotten extremely polarizing. So for example, the General Secretary of NU Supreme Council in an opinion piece stated that Islam is a latent, is, is a latent enduring threat to the existence of the unitary state of the Republic of Indonesia as a multi-faith and pluralistic Panchasila nation. Okay, so that the strong ideo ideological contestation, they, the Islamists, want to caliphate. They are an existential threat to us. So this has, this fear factor um, was a key part in the, um, in the campaign. Uh, and then the third way in which Joko we uh, attempted to co-opt it was by demonstrations of personal piety, leading um, prayer programs, making that quick trip to Mecca in the cooling off period, et cetera, okay? Now, on the other hand, he has also used coercive measures against his opponent. He's targeted Muslim preachers um, from Pabobo's camp. He uh, arrested a whole slew of them in the 200, uh, sorry, the 2016 demonstrations. Um, he has leveled charges against key leaders, including the head of um, the Islamic Defenders Front, who has fled to Saudi Arabia. 
in July 2017, Jokowi issued a presidential uh, regulation later approved by Parliament um, that granted the government sweeping powers to outlaw social organizations they deemed a threat to the national ideology, again, of Panchasilla. And they used this to outlaw Hizbut Tahrir, um, an international Islamist group that it excuse violence, so it's certainly not a terrorist organization, but it does want to establish a caliphate. Um, and they have also used the police security forces to clamp down on um, Prabowo opponents, particularly this um, Gagtai president or change the president movement. So what we've seen is that this is the first time in the democratic era that a president has used the security apparatus against his political principles, or sorry, political opponents, which of course is um, a throwback to the Soharto era and not something we really wanted to see in the democratic era. And just the third thing I want to mention <coughs> briefly is this decline of the strength and importance of political parties. Um, early in the Indonesian reform era, uh, political identification with political parties was fairly high at about 80%. Today, depending on which poll you look at, it's declined to about 10 or 20%. In part, this is traceable to a 2009 change uh, in election law that shifted from a closed party to an open party list. Now, this change was made because in the old system, you, the power brokers in the political parties would rank different candidates on a list. And who got elected was determined by A, how many votes the party got and where the candidates ranked on the list. So party bosses could rank people who did not live in local areas high on the list. They would get elected. They would have no accountability to their local constituencies. Instead, they were accountable to their party bosses. So this change was designed to ensure that candidates were more accountable to their constituencies. The perverse consequence is that you now have candidates from the same party competing against one another. Um, and the party doesn't have funds to give to them, so they are now dependent on oligarchs, local power brokers, um, rich people, etc., for financial support. So they are now not accountable to the parties, but also not necessarily to their voters. Um, so that what we see then is that this gives power to incumbents. So in many local elections, at least the last time, you saw two thirds of incumbents being reelected. It gives power to the bro uh, bureaucrats because they form key uh, parts of local campaign teams because of their ability uh, to distribute patronage as well as their increasing ability to uh, run as candidates. And it clearly uh, stymies bureaucratic reform uh, because it's a huge issue. So on that rather pessimistic note, um, I know Adam's going to have a much more optimistic view. I just want to say that Jokowi's victory uh, is obviously um, a good trend. But when we look at the Jokowi of 2014, as a key reformer, as an advocate of pluralism, democracy, an advocate for human rights. Uh, the trends are going in a different direction. Now that Marav Amin is VP, it's pretty clear that this trend toward conservative Islamism will continue, and we're likely to see a continued erosion of civil and political rights, particularly for minorities more contestation within the Islamic community, um, and some other worrying trends. I've talked too long. Thank mm -hmm. you very much for your attention. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Adam? Thank you. Thank you both. Um, and thanks for, uh, Amy, thanks for, for hosting uh, today's discussion. Um, sort of very timely after um, what happened yesterday. So I, uh, I do have a slightly more upbeat uh, view than, uh, than Anne-Marie, and I'm going to accentuate it just to, just to create a bit of a, a, a dynamic that will hopefully lead to a good discussion afterwards. Um, I will start with kind of, um, since I was listening to Amory talk, sort of a, 
a, a, a comment that I would use to describe Indonesia today that for those of us who have been following um, Indonesia and Southeast Asia for, for a long time, um, seems a little uh, odd to say even today, which is the following, that Indonesia is um, by a considerable margin the most um, robust, lively democracy in Southeast Asia. Um, that seems like uh, for a long time when I was working in Southeast Asia that I thought that that is a sentence that would never come out of my <laughs> mouth. So I, I just to take a long-term view, I think it's, it's helpful to, to, to bear that in mind. Um, there are certainly flaws to it. Um, there are flaws in, in every democracy, and, I'll, um, and, I, and I think all the points that Amory made are in terms of the, 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 the liberalism deficit or right, I, I would not describe Indonesia having sort of a, a in, in the group of, of countries that we say are sort of having a democracy recession. Um, it is, to, to get to sort of the point that Amory was making, um, was yesterday the largest um, one day uh, direct presidential election um, ever, I think. Um, mm -hmm. uh, 193 million voters, 80% turnout, that's 5% up from the 24 election where they had 75% turnout. The sort of feared voter intimidation from the hardline Muslim groups that a lot of people in the Jacobi camp are very worried about by and large did not happen. Um, it was largely peaceful. Um, in fact, it was almost entirely peaceful. There were a couple of snafus in Sulawesi and Papua where ballot papers didn't arrive in time and those votes had to get rescheduled for today. Um, but by and large, it was, it was sort of carried out in, in, a, in, a, in a festival type environment. Um, the, uh, it's, a, it's a massive bureaucratic uh, undertaking, um, 800,000 um, polling stations across the country, 241,000 candidates running for 20,000 um, slots uh, across national, provincial, and district elections. It was uh, quite an amazing uh, feat just from a, from a logistical point of view, and um, Indonesians uh, participated in it. Um, with, with a great degree of, of, of commitment and, uh, and, and indeed uh, optimism. So um, I think it's, you know, we're kind of repeating each other on that point, but, but I think it's, it's, it's worthwhile um, just to make the point that this is a government that's very committed to, um, it took a lot of money and a lot of effort to, to kind of uh, get that uh, all carried out. Now in terms of the um, election results, I had a few slides which I'm not sure Let's see, how I, I'll probably do that wrong too. Um, could have had a little training on this earlier. There we go, there we go. There we go. that looks familiar. Mm -hmm. All right, so this one, um, again, it's, it's about a, about a the, quick, the quick counts are anywhere from sort of nine and a half to an 11 and a half um, <coughs> win for Jacoby, um, which are, uh, the quick counts, as, as Emory said, are, are not s surveys, they're sort of, there are multiple levels of monitors on the polls, so they're actually counting the votes two or three times. Um, suggests, reflects a certain distrust, <laughs> but nevertheless, it does give you accurate quick count uh, results on the day. Um, yeah, these are, these, this is a lower margin of victory than most of the polls that did, just did the quick counts had been suggesting, uh, which were more like in the 15 to 18 percent um, uh, leadership, uh, sort of victory margin for Jacoby. Um, and we can kind of, there's some theories as to that. We can maybe talk about that a bit later. There was a large undecided uh, cohort in all of the polls uh, up, until, up until election day. And it, um, what these numbers suggest is that uh, Prabowo got two-thirds or above of those undecided votes uh, on the day. Uh, we don't yet know, uh, there was a big movement, a lot of people calling for um, people to, to spoil their votes, goal put, um, and not vote. We haven't seen those numbers yet in terms of what percentage of the votes that was the case. Um, and so there's a, little, a great deal of analysis to be done on these um, uh, on the votes, on, on, the, on the exit polls, uh, the exit poll interviews, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll know more as, as time goes by, but this seems to be where we're gonna, we're gonna be. Um, Prabowo uh, announced early in the day that he felt his party had won 55% of the vote, and then later in the day he said his party, his group, had won 62% of the vote. Um, so one immediate question is whether uh, this, this margin of victory um, how the Prabowo camp uh, deals with that. They have been um, laying the case for 
making an argument that there was widespread vote fraud. Um, uh, no doubt there will be some noise from the, the Gurindra coalition to that end. I think most people think that this is enough of a margin of victory to not really put enough wind in the sails of that movement, although Pro has called on his um, certain, and in particular sort of the more um, hardline Islamic followers to, uh, to start protesting uh, already to try to influence the, uh, the election commission on how it might rule on this. Uh, but again, this is a, he did the same thing in 2014. It sort of largely fizzled out uh, after a couple of weeks, and this is a larger margin of victory than 2014. So most of our observers think that's probably going to be kind of what's going to happen this time as well. Um, which one did I press last time? There we go. So, uh, but but provincially, and again, these are these are early uh, indications. Um, he did not do as well as he did uh, last time. He lost half the provinces. He did hold on to East Java by a comfortable margin and Central Java by a smaller one. Um, but he lost, as you can see, pretty much uh, all of Sumatra except for Lampung and Belitung and Banka out in the sea. Um, he lost two sort of very important provinces in Sulawesi, South and Southeast Asia in Sulawesi, that his previous pri pri uh, vice president, Yusuf Kala, had kind of delivered into his corner in 2014. Otherwise, the, the, the provincial outcomes are largely uh, the same. Um, the, the data is still coming in as to whether the coattail effect actually happened or not. There's, there's quite a lot of evidence that suggests that it didn't, that um, out in local elections that um, people didn't even really talk about the presidential candidacy. It was you know, the kind of the, the classic all politics is local. It was people using local issues and personal loyalties and family relations, et cetera, were sort of stronger drivers of, of um, votes. And so as a result, you've got um, a pretty diverse set of, of uh, well, you still have the same diverse set of parties. You actually, we actually have one less party than we had last time. Uh, we had 10 parties last time, now we have nine. Uh, Hanora, one of um, Jacoby's parties, did not make the 4% threshold. Um, we still have four uh, parties that uh, describe themselves as Islamic parties, PAN, PKS, PTGA, and PKB. Um, there was, there was uh, a lot of, um, although I think it was PAN, just barely made it over the, the limit. There was, uh, earlier, earlier in the cycle, it looked like both PTGA, uh, PPP, and, and PAN would not make it over the 4% threshold, so we'd only have two parties that explicitly describe themselves as Islamic parties in the parliament. In the end, that did not happen. All four were there. The, the hardest line um, Islamic party, PBB, um, Yusro Mahendra's party, um, did not uh, get over, did not get, actually get close to the 4% uh, threshold, uh, nor did um, Tommy Suharto's uh, Burkaya party and uh, the other, uh, the, and, and, and five others. So there were seven parties, there were 16 parties that ran, only nine made it over the 4% threshold. There's still some re there's a process of reallocating the seats that those other seven parties won to the others, and um, uh, that's still a, or a little bit, there's some confusion as to what the formula for that is, uh, is gonna be. Um, he has a smaller coalition, uh, Jacoby does, than he did in, in, in 2014. Um, 2014, he had about 60% of the parliamentary seats were sort of at least nominally in his coalition. Now he's down to about 53%. Um, which suggests that there's some horse trading um, to come up quite quickly, and then the obvious party for for Jacoba to try to bring over would be the Democrats, uh, the party of former President uh, Cecilia Bambang Yudhoyono. Um, this is probably uh, suggest a good job is in the offing for SBY's son Agus uh, in Jacoby's next cabinet. Um, uh, it, it, clearly, there were signs at the end of this coalition that SBY had come to regret his decision to join Prabowo's coalition. Uh, at the big April 7th rally in Jakarta by uh, Prabowo and the Gringer coalition, which was dominated by basically the more um, uh, Islamic uh, parts of the Gringer coalition, the Democrat party did not even show up. Agus Yudhoyono did not even um, attend the event. Uh, and SPY subsequently wrote a public letter to uh, Prabowo uh, castigating him for such overt identity politics and kind of a, a, a 
a walking away from the, the Indonesian <coughs> pluralist tradition. So uh, I would say that that party is probably the, the clearest one up for grabs. Uh, at any rate, um, SPY tends to operate as a fairly independent character anyway. So essentially, he'll probably be counted in Jokowi's coalition whether he says so or not. Um, uh, so again, I mean, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, about sort of Islam and domestic politics um, before getting to some comments on the economy. Uh, clearly, as, as Amory was saying, this was the most strident use of identity politics in the four uh, post Suharto elections. Um, I think it remains to be seen. I think there'll be you know a lot of analysis to kind of digging into that statement a bit more um, and looking, you know, to what extent did social media sort of create a sense that Indonesia is maybe more polarized than it actually is, um, which is sort of a view that I have some sympathy for. Um, it clearly, uh, you know, with, with 86 for 87 percent of Indonesians um, d describing themselves as Muslim, uh, um, Obviously, Islam, you know, the, the definition of Islam and, and, and one's thoughts about the role of Islam in politics and at a, at a, at a, at a community level and at, a, at an individual level, to what extent you, you think first of Islamic interests when you walk into a voting booth are all sort of subject to a great deal of analysis post this election. But at the end of the day, um, the numbers are the numbers, and the plural, more pluralistic, more optimistic view of Jokowi has prevailed over the what became a very dark, dystopic uh, view of the world, um, if I can say this in Washington, almost Trumpian view of the world um, that Prabowo put forward, that basically everything outside the borders was hostile to Indonesia, was trying to exploit Indonesia, was subverting Indonesians' principles, was stealing Indonesians' wealth. There was nothing good happening outside the borders of Indonesia. Um, and there was not a lot good happening within the borders of Indonesia either. Um, and that view event just, you know, it, it got to sort of its natural base uh, and never really got above it. Um, and so I, I'm, I, I take a more cautious view as to, you know, where this, that, that particular debate on uh, Islam and, and Islamism is going to play in Jokowi's next term. Um, as, uh, as Amory noted, there was a debate over who Jokowi was going to pick for his vice president between uh, Mahmoud and uh, Maruf Amin. Uh, we forget, perhaps, that his first choice for his vice president was his current vice president, Yusuf Kala, who was, um, uh, in the end, decided to be term limited out um, because he had run as he was. SPY's vice president and SPY's first term. So he had served two terms, but not consecutively. And constitutional lawyers talked it over and decided that's still qualified to be term limited, so he couldn't run. But he was Jacoby's first choice, and not least in part because he probably would have delivered those two provinces in Sulawesi to Jokowi that he's now lost. Um, in terms of where um, you know, what role Maruf Amin is going to play in, in, in kind of day-to-day -day politics. My own sense is that it's going to be reasonably limited. Um, Yusuf Kala is a, is a vastly more experienced, um, savvy uh, politician uh, than Maruf Amin, who's, this is his first job in national politics, so, so to speak. Um, and Yusuf Kala ended up with quite a limited role uh, as Jokowi's vice president in his first term. Um, Jokowi tends to keep his, his cards pretty close to his chest, and he has an idea of what he wants to do, kind of rolls out as VP when it's useful to him, um, but otherwise does, doesn't necessarily take a lot of input. And I don't see any evidence to suggest that he's going to treat his second term VP much differently. Um, You've got then a divide between sort of formal representative um, uh, Islamic groups and non-formal groups. So you have we have lost that chart. Yeah, we have we do have four Islamic uh, parties here. The lar the largest of one, by the way, uh, the PKB, um, in in Jokowi's camp. Uh, the quotes that Amri made for the Secretary General of the Nautilus Lama, which is the largest Muslim organization in Indonesia describing Islam as the greatest threat to Indonesia's unitary state 
is a pretty stark and um, frankly pretty compelling reflection of the divide within Indonesian Islam. So I, I think we need to be careful to jump ahead of the story in terms of where, you know, the, the monolithic nature of Indonesia Islam. There most clearly has been convergence. Um, so we had, you know, there are various ways of describing the Ummah or the Islamic community of Indonesia. And we don't have that much time to go into it now, but between Abangan and Santri and Priyai is sort of the Gertzian view. And then there's these two big organizations, Al-Tal Lama and Muhammadiyah. And clearly there's been a merging and convergence across all of that. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're all the same. Um, there's still fairly large divisions within these streams of Indonesian Islamic thought. And I, I again, I, I'm sort of as interested as many of the, of the scholars are about what the data is going to show about whether appeals to religiosity or religious themes uh, counted for much in, in the end of the day uh, in this vote. Um, for the first time, Indonesia actually gave a, um, a questionnaire to all of the participants, all the, all the 241,000 candidates, which was ostensibly required, but not everybody did it. And basically just basic name, address, marital status, whether you've ever been convicted of corruption, the basic questions for any politician. Um, but there was also a, a, a sort of a fill it in paragraph, like your own personal statement and why you're running for office. So of the 241,000 candidates that ran, about 150,000 or so submitted that piece of paper. And about half of those uh, actually had filled in that personal platform statement. And so, so you're dealing, okay, with 60, 70,000 out of 240,000. So there's a data sampling uh, issue. But nevertheless, it's a pretty sizable sample. And within that sample, only a very small minority of candidates made overt appeals to religion as, as the reasons for why they were running for office. Um, and again, I think the, the sort of the overall elections show that. You have a number of interesting stuff that's already coming out of analysis of that, which is that um, you would sort of expect the local elections to be more that way because you're dealing with smaller um, uh, sample size of voters, where you'd expect national candidates to do less of that because they're trying to appeal to a broader audience. Um, as often is the case with Indonesian politics, the results are the opposite of one expects, and nationalist parties actually made more use of appeals to religious issues than local candidates did. And I think there's, there's much more to be still kind of dug out of that data, um, you know, before we sort of, I think, get to a comfortable view as to how the role of Islam generally and the role of Maruf Amin as a, um, an Enu cleric uh, in, uh, in, in sort of the, in, in Jokowi's administration. Um, all right, I'm probably going to already run out of time. So let me, um, so that was the point on Prabo. I, I, like I said, I don't think that's going to add up. Here's just sort of a timeline of events. There's about uh, a couple of weeks before we get the formal results. Um, there's sort of a one-month period to deliberate again uh, on, on, on vote fraud claims. Um, it's not quite clear, frankly, whether the election commission is going to deal with local and provincial complaints first and then get to the presidential ones. So the presidential ones might, might actually be a little bit later in July, August. Um, but nevertheless, I, I think we're, there, this isn't that close of an election. It's been regionally transparent, so nobody's really expecting major shocks to the system. But then bear in mind what I just said about Indonesian politics. Um, it's Prabowo and his negative. So let me, let me I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, economic policy. And I'll just leave a few quotes up there by um, Prabowo while I talk about it. For foreign investors, this was a particularly unedifying experience watching Indonesians campaign. Um, the, the campaign rhetoric from both sides range, range from nationalism to outright xenophobia. Um, there was very little that was sort of positive that was said about uh, Indonesia's engagement in the global economy, uh, the role of free trade deals, global supply chains, foreign capital, foreign technology. None of that really came up in public, um, but rather these sort of comments were much more part and parcel of the, of the campaign dialogue. Um, 
Jacoby was not nearly as, as xenophobic as some of the Prabowo comments, but he did um, rely quite heavily on his, uh, and proudly on his track record of resource nationalism, um, and took credit for sort of pushing a lot of foreign uh, energy mining oil and gas companies out of Indonesia. Um, and, 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 and while took a more um, sober view of the need for Indonesia to maintain um, uh, its engagement with the global economy, never really got too specific on that. So, uh, you know, our, our sort of advice has been really to try to, like, not listen too much, um, uh, but actually watch what's happening as, and, and instead of being what, watch what's being said or listen to what's being said. Um, nevertheless, you know, campaign rhetoric is no substitute for math. Uh, Indonesia faces an, an enormous uh, financing uh, gap, uh, and that's just to maintain growth at the current roughly 5% level, much less to try to step it up to the 7% annual growth level that Jokowi promised in 2014 and did not deliver on. He's not any longer promising that, by the way. Now he's sort of talking 55 to um, maybe 6%. Um, there's a $350 billion infrastructure deficit, um, according to Indonesia's own numbers. Um, there's about $150 billion needed just to kind of invest in, kind of from a capex ex expenditure point of view, in the oil and gas and mining sector. Um, Jokowi has done a lot of good things in his first uh, term, including, um, and, and probably most specifically, on hard infrastructure. Um, he promised to build uh, 1,000 kilometers of toll roads. Uh, to put that in perspective, in 2014, Indonesia had a total of about 800 kilometers of toll roads um, since the beginning of uh, independence. He's built about 800, so he's not going to quite make it, but he's going to get close. Um, he said he built 15 airports, he built 10, and a few others are being built. He's built over 100,000 kilometers of village roads. Uh, the one area that, he, that he's fallen well short of was the 35 gigawatt um, uh, plan for, for power generation. Um, he's only, only about three gigawatts, so less than 10% have been installed, but another 11 or 12 gigawatts are um, already been financially closed and under construction. So he'll get to almost half um, by, by next year. So there's, I mean, to, to give him credit, there's been a, a, a great deal accomplished on the infrastructure side. And for those of you who have been in Jakarta recently, the, the new MRT is opened up and uh, it works quite well. Um, there's been other elements of his economic performance from fiscal policy to monetary policy that's been very prudent. Uh, the budget deficit that was bouncing up against the legal cap of 3% of GDP is now down below 2%. Monetary policy has been very prudent to manage the currency slide last year. Uh, all in all, it's from a, from a monetary fiscal point of view, it's been a very prudently run administration. Um, People would argue, in fact, that it's been overly conservative, that they should be using the government in a more Keynesian way to kind of pump the economy more, which is not a, um, a, a was not a particular criticism that we thought he'd face uh, a couple of years ago, but, but, but that's, that's where we are. All that said, all that massive infrastructure that's been built, Indonesia still lags well below its peers in terms of infrastructure. So in the infrastructure in the World Economic Forum's competitive index on the infrastructure rating, Indonesia is still below India, Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam, uh, and much below China. So there's still, you know, it's not, it's not to say that that job is done. There's still a long way to go, but Indonesia has certainly closed the gap to its regional peers, uh, frankly, to a degree much greater than people anticipated Jokowi would be able to do. Um, within his second term, he's, he's, he's looking to continue that, but also to extend that into soft infrastructure. Uh, whoops, that's the wrong button, as usual. Uh, I don't want to get rid of that one. That way. No, I you have to wrong. point it that way. You've got to point it back. Yeah. Counterintuitive. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, I'll, I, yeah, then we're going to leave you forever. <laughs> just chart. Um, I'm going to need some help here because it, it's not working. Uh, Carl, do you want to like uh, <laughs> take over? All right, I give up. Um, Amy, I'm going to need some help. I can't get that off yeah, the, the chart. So I'll just keep talking. All right. Um, uh, so 
what are, what are things he has to work on? Uh, Indonesia does not collect enough tax. Uh, whether its tax ratio is 9% of GDP, as the pro-camp claimed, or 12%, as Jokowi claims, it is well below um, all the neighbors. Uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia are all at 15 to 18%. Um, doesn't sound like that big a gap, but it makes a big difference. Um, is there any help coming for that one? I, one? I can try, and then we'll... Brian, can you get on Andrea, please? That's a, that's we'll, a no. We'll, we'll, we'll work on it. All right, I've, I've, I've um, damaged the CSIS. Uh, so <laughs> uh, his, his, second his other commitment for term two is basically to push into soft infrastructure, into health and education in particular. Um, there's a variety of measures for this, but on most of them, Indonesia scores poorly. <laughs> Um, uh, in, in both health and education, it's, uh, uh, it's students' performance on STEM tests uh, come out uh, very uh, poorly, uh, even by emerging markets. Oh, there we go. Which slide would you like? Tax ratios. Um, now I've lost the thing. <laughs> uh, probably, probably just as well. Um, uh, what's this one? So uh, corruption, it's done very well. The, uh, Indonesia is the, is the red line. And so from, a, from a, uh, uh, dealing with corruption, Jokowi has done, I was actually quite surprised to see this number because corruption is not exactly a disappearing thing in Indonesia. But um, the Kapika, the, the, the Corruption Eradication Commission has been very active. It remains very publicly popular. Um, and it continues to be effective and to sort of tackle new, new things. Um, this is the uh, doing business. Again, Indonesia has gone from 120, I think there's about a total of 180 countries ranked. It's the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business survey. Um, it was about 120-ish when Jokowi came into power. It's now down to seven, low 70, 72, 73. So that's an enormous improvement, although uh, it does, again, remain sort of below uh, most of its regional peers. So there's, there's, there's more room still to go. Um, IP protection is on, again on the low end, so this is a, this is a threat to uh, you know one of the main pillars that that Jokowi is is pushing on, and what was one of the main appeals to the millennial voters was his commitment to the, to grow the digital economy, uh, both in the public sector through a whole a variety of e-government initiatives, e-procurement, e-budgeting, etc., but also to kind of continue providing. Um, support for private sector, uh, digital players, um, ride hailing, tra online travel platforms of which Indonesia's got a very vibrant industry. So improving IP protection is gonna be, is gonna be key for, for all of that. Uh, and in, as you can see, it's got a ways to go. Um, I'm gonna run out of time there. So that's not me anymore. Um, so I'll go back to that. Um, let me begin to wrap up. Um, there is still a great deal to do. Let me just sort of go through a little, a quick, a quick list of what I would, I, four, five or six things, what I would think are going to be the priorities for term two on the economic sphere for Jokowi. One is, I mentioned, is the tax ratio. Two is going to be, he needs to get a handle on the state enterprise, uh, state-owned enterprise growth. They have been. Uh, they now account for about 50% of assets equivalent to GDP. Uh, they've seen a massive rise in terms of their uh, percentage of economic activity in Jokowi's five years. A lot of that started because he wanted to push his infrastructure agenda very hard and fast, and it's just a lot easier to get SOEs to do what you tell them to do than private companies. Um, and there was probably a, a defensible argument. Uh, what's happened over time is that those SOEs given bigger balance sheets, given bigger capital injections from the national budget, have just continued to grow and grow and are pushing into all kinds of uh, areas that was not originally uh, in the plan. Just this week, uh, state-owned banks announced their own digital e-wallet, Link Aja, um, and every week there seems to be something like that. There are now uh, over 800 subsidiaries. Um, 
both national and foreign investors uh, keenly feel being crowded out uh, in a number of areas. And Jacoby is probably, I would suggest, is almost certainly going to have a problem with his domestic private capitalist class, to use that language, uh, if he can't find a way to roll back uh, SOE growth. Um, it needs to continue uh, deregulating and, and, and sort of removing bureaucratic red tape. Again, to give him credit, there's been a lot of progress in this area in term one. Uh, we talk details maybe later, but uh, it's, 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 it's more than lip service. There's been, and that's what accounts for that big, big gain in the, in the doing, ease of doing business ranking. Uh, but there's still a lot more, a lot more to do. Uh, he needs to continue engaging with the global economy, notwithstanding the, 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 the bulk of the campaign rhetoric. Uh, and again, to his credit, uh, there's been a lot of that happening even while this campaign was going on. So the uh, Indonesia signed last month or maybe two months ago a comprehensive economic partnership agreement with uh, Australia. There are a number of other FTAs being negotiated, including with the EU. Uh, I would argue that that remains critical to Indonesia's economic future because it's going to be those sorts of deals that are probably are his best chance of, of, of increasing domestic competitiveness by, by essentially bringing in a, a, a greater degree of competition in a number of industries that are now being opened up in these FTAs. Um, uh, and finally, on an organizational point, uh, there is an urgent need for just greater uh, uh, coordination um, and maybe even to use the word control over policy implementation. Uh, the, the coordinating ministries, uh, which were three, are now four, that are sort of a, a legacy of Suharto's uh, government are like, um, I liken it to sort of the uh, coccyx in the human anatomy. It just, you know, it kind of doesn't really, you don't kind of what its purpose is anymore. Um, but at any rate, they lack resources and they lack a legal mandate and they're, they're woefully ineffective in coordinating policy. And so if you ask, I think most investors at this point, is the bigger need now continue to reshape and refine policy or is to figure out a better way to implement the policy you have, you've got a much bigger crowd that's going to be in that second category than, than the former. Um, I had a few things to say about foreign policy and U.S. relations. Do you want me to hold yeah, off on that? Yeah, well, I'll ask questions on U.S. that. questions. Well, I'll, we, um, I'll, I'll pause there. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for two really uh, interesting and thankfully somewhat contrasting uh, presentations <laughs> that I think covered the the landscape really well in terms of selection and trends. And let me pick up on the um, the Islamic the Islamist point the, that both of you really went into some detail. And obviously, that's been a big concern about Indonesian politics that the rising role of Islam and Islamist thought in Indonesian politics, starting with the 212 movement, or perhaps not starting with that, but certainly that was a, the beginning of, of of a lot of real concern about the trends. And, and Adam gave a somewhat cautiously optimistic view that, uh, focusing on the pluralism within uh, Indonesian Islamic thought, and, including within politics, um, that perhaps these trends are, made, perhaps they've plateaued or uh, aren't as concerning. But I wanted to turn to Anne-Marie to ask your uh, thoughts about that going forward. How concerned should we be about trends um, in terms of growing um, Islamization of Indonesian politics? And, and how should we think about not only the vice president, um, Maruf, and his role and his priorities uh, and how he'll seek to enact them, but, but in terms of the space for civil liberties of non-Muslims in Indonesia, um, the LBGT community, uh, things like that. Uh, what, what, will you, what do you expect and what, what will you be looking for in the next few years? Um, I think the political space for issues like LGBT, free speech, you're seeing this really interesting issue. I don't know if anybody's focusing on it. This bill, um, the Violence Against Women bill, or violence against women, by sexual violence, I forget the exact title, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, seeks to make it easier to protect victims of violence. And this is obviously a bill that had a lot of support in Congress or in Parliament. Um, and it has now become a huge target of the Islamist movement because it says that 
sexual violence is defined as violence when it's not consensual. But it, the way in which it's been painted by the Islamists is that, gee, that means that open marriage is okay, um, homosexuality is okay, uh, um, you know, premarital sex is okay, and they have framed this in completely cultural terms rather than in terms of protection of women. And so you have this crazy situation where one of the key backers of the bill is uh, Hashim's daughter, the uh, proposed brother, um, and many of the other kind of civil liberties protecting rights. And this mm -hmm. has become a target in even many of the Islamic women's groups on the more right-wing side are saying that this is necessary to protect our family, our daughter's purity, etc. Mm -hmm. So this is just one of these debates in the culture wars where you're seeing this really play out. So I realize that's kind of a nitty on the ground. Mm -hmm. Like Adam, I don't think that Maruf is going to have a huge impact on policy writ large, but he is certainly going to be funneling patronage and, and things like that. And I think that that is clearly something that can occur. I think one of the real worrying trends, and here I'm channeling Sidney Jones again, um, is that the police have become politicized. The police who are in charge of combating terrorism clearly see this right-wing Islamist group as a threat. Mm -hmm. And they are conflating that with terrorists. But many of them eschew violence, but they want greater role in Islam. I mean, it's, it's a very diverse group, right? Mm -hmm. But what they're doing is saying, because you are targeting Panchasila, you are necessarily a threat. And you're seeing a big debate among uh, the right wing Islamists saying, well, we, pr we support Panchasila, but we support the original one which had what's known as the Jakarta Charter or the seven words, um, that the first principle is a belief in one God. And originally there were supposed to be seven words which said, with the obligation of Muslims to follow Sharia law. It's more than seven words, but anyway, that's, <laughs> that's the continent. And mm -hmm. so they're saying they want to return to that. So if you, mm -hmm. so you have this debate where everybody's fighting about Panchasila, but they're mm -hmm. trying to reinterpret it. And so, I am not the expert on this, but people who are are very worried, and that's why the police see who are dedicated to preserving the unitary state of Indonesia, um, which they claim the Islamist desire to establish a caliphate is completely antithetical to that. Mm -hmm. Not all of these groups want to establish a caliphate. So both sides are painting one mm -hmm. another in ideological terms. Mm -hmm. um, so I, whether or not this polarization extends throughout th after the election mm -hmm. is very unclear. It's unclear whether the police, which are seen to really support an ooh and one side on this, mm -hmm. can be viewed as credible protectors of all of Indonesians. Mm -hmm. And it's really unclear what's going to happen over the next five years mm -hmm. as some of these groups now are going to try to translate their street power into greater political mm -hmm. power mm -hmm. and how that plays out. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly can't predict. Um, shifting gears just a bit, um, thinking about the next Jokowi administration, um, Adam, you laid out some of his uh, key priorities, especially in the economic sphere. Um, now that he no longer has to worry about winning re-election because this is his second and therefore final term, he's term limited to two terms, um, do you expect, uh, Adam, that he will um, take a different tack in terms of staffing his cabinet? Uh, you know, in, his, in the first term, of course, he was very careful to, be, to balance all the different members of his coalition uh, 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 to protect himself politically and ensure that he can win re-election. Uh, do you think he will still be playing uh, along those sorts of lines, or do you think he will really be focused more on trying to put the right people in to get his key priorities accomplished? Um, that's a great question. I don't think there's a, uh, an easy answer to that one. Um, I would say a lot, a lot of people are, are waiting, very keenly waiting, to see what his next cabinet looks like. Um, I think there's, there's, there's a large 
group that thinks we will see that sooner rather than later. He's not going to wait. Like, uh, like if, he, if there was a new president, then right. um, if you remember that timeline chart, the, the, the current parliament actually sits until the 30th of September. And then mm -hmm. so it's not until October that you have a new parliament until late October to the present is inaugurated, so if it was a new president, you actually can't have a new cabinet until you're inaugurated. So we'd, we'd have another six month wait. But since he's already president, he can change his cabinet at any time. And I think the view is he'll probably do that sooner rather than later to mm -hmm. kind of, um, frankly, get a lot of attention off of the campaign rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Now, what he does with that, of course, is, is still open, you know, a lot of, a lot of different views on that. Um, I don't know whether, whether history is any guide here, but at this stage of the game in 2009, when SBY was in, you know, in between his two terms, there was a great deal of hope, um, not least because he kept saying it, uh, that he was going to, because he didn't have to get reelected again, he could be much more open and, and, and progressive and reformist, et cetera. And as we know, that didn't really happen. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, Jacoby is saying the same things uh, in private, uh, mm -hmm. not on the campaign trail, but I'm going to sort of pick it up and be more deregulation and, and all kinds of reformist things mm -hmm. and uh, in health and education and more infrastructure and uh, more free trade and all, all kinds of, you know, what, what investors and would like to hear. Um, mm -hmm. Whether he, 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 you know, how he reads the tea leaves from these election results, and it's still very early days, I think mm -hmm. will have some bearing into what he, he will do. Uh, I, you know, just from a personality point of view, he, he is quite an output-oriented person. He's, he, he, he looks at results, not input. Um, and where he focuses attention, he has delivered pretty, pretty well uh, in terms of, of output. So I, I, I have, you know, just as, a, you know, in a, as an observer, I would say I would have a higher degree of confidence that he will kind of resume that reformist zeal that we saw extended glimpses of in the first three and a half years of his first five-year term, mm -hmm. uh, and that we will see more of that. Um, but, a, but a lot will depend on the cabinet, precisely because of the point I was making earlier that he, he doesn't really have a good, you know, I'm going to use a military term here, but a command and control system for his cabinet. He, mm -hmm. there, was a, there, was a, there was a unit called UKP and Pot, which sort of was in the president's office that was created under SPY that kind of tracked you know, the, what each minister was supposed to be doing and whether they were doing it and that kind of thing. And it was one of the first things that Jacoby shut down when he became president in 2014. Nobody really knows why, but he, it's, 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 its absence is keenly felt because mm -hmm. without the office of the president having the means to kind of keep track of what the, what the, what the ministers and what the ministries are doing um, and the coordinating ministries simply not being effective um, in this kind of current parliamentary presidential uh, mix uh, that Indonesian politics has become, um, it's very hard for a president to keep track of things. And so what, what that means, you know, that relevant to your question, is that getting good technocratically competent people in at least the six or eight ministries that kind of matter in the economic sphere will be, I think, the major milestone in terms of what investors are going to kind of keep their eye on to make their, to come to an answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. great. And then finally, on the implications for Indonesia's foreign policy um, uh, to, to either or both of you. Um, wh what, do we, what do you think a, a second term of Jokowi will look like? You've talked about the trade um, um, interests. You know, perhaps he'll, he'll return to his free trade agenda, focusing on some free trade agreements. But do we expect uh, Jokowi to perhaps be a little more engaged in regional or global affairs? There's been a lot of disappointment, obviously, in the international community that Jokowi has played such a passive role given Indonesia's tradition of leading ASEAN and, and having a more, uh, you know, more of a leadership position certainly within the region and, 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 and Jokowi has been relatively passive compared to his predecessors. Do you think that will continue based on Jokowi's own interests and priorities or do you think there may be uh, room to have more of a regional role or global role? I really don't see it. <laughs> I mean, he does not enjoy it. He does not come to the UN. He hates ASEAN meetings. He thinks they're a waste of time. Um, you know, he has lobbied to try to get the summits reduced and reshaped. 
he has a better sense of the G20 and all of that mm -hmm. because it plays to his economic interests. Mm -hmm. So I don't see that changing at all. The direction of Indonesian foreign policy, partly it's going to depend on who he appoints as foreign minister. Yeah. So when you have a president who does not like foreign policy, that can give great scope to a foreign minister if a foreign minister is, you know, strategic and active and really kind of willing to take the, you know, the mm -hmm. ball and run with it. Um, that's not been the case under um, Retno Marsudi, very low profile role, didn't have a lot of experience any really in ASEAN or other multilateral organizations. And so she's focused on key priorities that were Joko Wee's priorities, but his priorities were all domestically focused. Mm -hmm. So a little bit on the economic side, really focused in on this protection of migrant workers um, abroad mm -hmm. that clearly resonates with voters and it's something that she is the first female um, foreign uh, minister has really made her own, but that's not the thing that raises Indonesia's profile. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's really going to depend. Mm -hmm. Somebody like Rizal Sukma, who was his key foreign policy advisor in the first term, has been in um, London as ambassador there. If you had somebody like Rizal coming back, you could see a very different mm -hmm. foreign policy. Right. Adam, anything to add? Um, yeah, I'm going to sort of um, keep to my role here of being a little bit more optimistic than, uh, than <laughs> Marie. Um, listen, I think there's a there's a. I mean, I, I, I don't I don't disagree with 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 Emery's description of, of term one. Um, I think and, and sort of his 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 kind of dislike of, of large global events and APEC CEO meetings and that kind of thing. Um, on the one, I, I don't, you know, he's gotten away with not doing that because he could send Yusuf Kala to a lot of those meetings. Um, I suspect he's not going to use Maruf Amin um, mm -hmm. for that role. Uh, I don't think that's it's what he wants to sort of have representing Indonesia right now. Uh, I, I could be wrong. So I think he, he just for that simple reason alone, is going to be forced to go to many more of these global meetings than he probably would care to do so. Um, one, two. There is a there is sort of an increasing pull from the rest of ASEAN for Indonesia to play a stronger role in ASEAN, in large part just because of the the kind of the whole chessboard recalibration that's going on because of the U.S. China uh, mm -hmm. you know strategic competition and how it's playing out across the region. Um, you know, I'd, I'd make the point that Jokowi is now the norm in ASEAN, not the outlier. So if you're looking at Duterte in the Philippines or Khun Prayut in, uh, in Thailand, uh, Suu Kyi in Myanmar, uh, the, the norm is to be focused domestically. Um, maybe that's just the way the world, maybe that's the way America is. I mean, that is, maybe that's just the way the world is now. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and ASEAN's under a lot of stress uh, because of this recalibration and with the U.S.-China pressures. Uh, on the economic side, you're beginning to see kind of a two-tier ASEAN be between the four that are members of the CPTPP and the rest that are still in RCEP, AEC, you know, limbo land. Um, and then you've got a bunch of these key leaders who are very domestic focused. So ASEAN is a very different place uh, than it was five years ago for a variety of reasons. And uh, nevertheless, there, there, is, there is plenty of people around ASEAN who don't like that, um, who do not, who are, going to be disagree, who are going to be disagreeable with anything that they think undermines the centrality of ASEAN's role or its institutions like the free and open independent you know, India, India in the Pacific, Pacific, I keep forgetting what that stands for. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be some pushback on that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, again, I, I, I have uh, probably I would give higher marks to, uh, to Evo Retno um, than maybe Anne Reed. I think she's done, I think she did have a steep learning curve, as she herself has said many times. I think she's done a very commendable job um, uh, on the Rohingya issue in Rakhine State in Myanmar. Um, and has really sort of, I think, led ASEAN's response to that. Um, you can argue with how effective it's been, but it's clearly Indonesia's playing the leadership role in that. Um, you know, whether Indonesia comes to play a stronger role on 
uh, how ASEAN positions itself vis-a-vis -vis China on you know, code of conduct issues, South China Sea issues, et cetera. I, I kind of doubt it. I sort of agree with Anne-Marie on that. But there will be pressures for it to do so. Um, listen, most, most of the near-term China conversation is going to be more project and country specific through BRI and, and, and other ad hoc uh, infrastructure, fund, China funded infrastructure deals. Um, you know, ASEAN as a whole is, um, is trying to cling to the status quo, which is that it does not choose uh, mm -hmm. as, as long as it possibly can. And, Having watched ASEAN for a long time, I have a lot of confidence they're going to be able to do that for some time yet. Um, I think on the, on the, on the U.S. side, um, you know, there's probably more upside risk than downside risk, to put it in kind of investment banker terms. I think, in other words, it's, not, it's an okay relationship now. Uh, the mill-mill is good, the people-to-people is good, the, the econ relationship is not nearly as good as it could be. Um, but I think there's probably, again, I think there's more upside there than, than downside. But Indonesia is, is, is going to be, the, if, if anybody ever chooses sides, Indonesia will be like in, near the last in the queue to, to do that. Uh, and will actually probably never get out of that queue, um, which is probably a good thing. Um, <laughs> And, and so it's, it's, it will, it will you, know, it's a, you know, I think, in, you know, I think Jokowi is going to walk away from the BRI form in Beijing a little while with a large check in his pocket. Uh, and probably the response to that is to try to figure out, you know, how to make sure a couple of U.S. investments come in. You know, they're very actively trying to get Indian and Taiwanese money in particular into some large infrastructure projects in Indonesia. They would like to have more U.S. money. It's just there aren't too many U.S players writing checks at the moment. So. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Well, we have a little over 10 minutes, so we're going to open it up for questions. I'm starting with uh, Stanley Roth here. Stanley, if you could just briefly introduce yourself and ask a question. Hi, Stanley Roth, currently retired and unaffiliated, but my question relates to my stint in the second Clinton administration, where I had the misfortune to have to deal with Prabowo, one of the worst human beings I've ever met. <laughs> Seriously. And so, my question, I know you're no still longer, unaffiliated, Stanley? <laughs> <laughs> My question relates to Prabowo and reflects the fact that I no longer follow things closely. I'm hoping, tell me if there's any chance that Prabowo is now finished politically, having lost twice, he'll be 72 the next election. If you're going to tell me no, he's still alive and remains dangerous, likely to run, my question stops. But if you tell me you think there's a good chance he won't, what I'm trying to learn is there anybody on the opposition scene who is potentially as evil, bad, <laughs> dangerous as Prabowo, or is there somehow a possibility of good news? <laughs> uh, do you, well, do either of you want to? Uh, I, I, my, my own view is that this is probably the last hurrah. Um, you know, he's running three, he was a VP candidates, you know, in 09, he ran as president, 14, and, and this one. Um, I think, I, you know, and, and, and to be honest, I, I think many people sort of watched his performance in this 2019 election. It was almost like a mailed-in performance. It, it, it was uh, much less energetic than uh, 2014. Um, it just didn't have the same kind of, you know, sing to it. I, I mean, of, of the four candidates on the two tickets, um, you know, I, I would say maybe the single biggest winner was Sandy Uno. Mm -hmm. um, he kind of comes out with a political platform. I think he comes out of this in the, uh, in the way too early uh, ranking in 2024, as they say. He's probably now number one on that list. Um, he was sort of the Jokowi of the 2019 campaign, kind of the fresh face, uh, you know, outsider, um, except he had a lot more money than Jokowi did in 2014. Um, so I think we'll, we'll see a lot more of him. I think at least his camp in the Gurindra thinks that the smart thing for Gurindra to do would be for Provo to step down halfway through and, and have Sandy become the head of Gurindra, and that would become the core of the opposition uh, alliance or coalition. Um, you know, the, the, some of the Islamic um, group uh, that's close to, uh, to Prabowo won't be happy about that. Um, but in the end, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of like where we were in 2014 where, you know, Megawati did, want, did not want to accept the poll saying PDP is going to do twice as better if we run Jokowi than if we run you. 
I think we'll probably see something similar in 2023 in Garindra polls that, you know, um, San Diego is going to do much, much better in, in, in the party, for the party if he runs than some of the other, Islam, you know, some of the people from the Islam, hardline Islamic camp around him. That my two cents. Um, Carl, you had a question? Uh, we all reflect where we come Can you just introduce from. yourself first, quickly? We all reflect our past and where we come from. And I'd like to ask about corruption because I come from Boston uh, and I thought we invented it. Uh, no, uh, I recently read a study indicating that a third of the voters in uh, the last day payer election accepted money. Now the good news is two thirds of them didn't stay bought, uh, and, but 10% of them did, at least according to this study. Do you know of anyone who's working on this at the local level with regard to this election that we've just seen? I, I, I don't know in terms of scholarly work on it. Um, journalistically, there, there doesn't, I, I haven't seen compelling you know, sort of journalistic accounts that suggest that corruption in this election was worse than any other election, to put it that way. Um, you know, I mean, vote, vote buying is, you know, uh, you, Vote buying is one of those terms that lends itself to different definitions. Uh, I, I, my, my, I mean, there's, there's, there's money in the system, uh, but there's not that much money in the system relative to the number of people that would have to be bought to make a difference, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's a scale issue. Um, so, you know, whether money politics or vote buying is a bigger factor in Indian democracy than you know, any other emerging market democracy or, or even a developed country democracy. I, I, don't, I don't see that as, a, as, a, as a, myself, as a, I, don't, I have not come across any evidence suggesting that as a, that is a principal driver of electoral outcomes. Anne-Marie? Um, I just want to say two things. Number one, um, you didn't have a lot of vote buying early in the democratic era because people voted for parties and you had that party identification. The vote buying, particularly at the local level, um, really increased substantially after the 2009 open list, but also in 2005 when you had direct local elections. Um, so then you had uh, folks doing that. Um, Ed Aspinall and um, Ward Berenshoff, they just came out with a book, Clientelism on Money Politics, and they have studied exactly what you said at the local level. So. They're the experts. It's very interesting to know how much money changed hands. Well, but they also show, oh, I don't know the number, but that even the candidates who give the money only expect 50% return, that 50% of the people that they give money to will mm -hmm. vote for them. OK, Marvin? <coughs> right, right, here's, yeah, could you introduce yourself briefly, uh, Marvin? And then uh, Marvin Ott, um, formerly federal government, now Wilson Center in Hopkins. Um, foreign policy question, a rise of Islamist sentiment, we, you know, exploring that. Does this have any foreign policy implication? A sort of simple thought would be, okay, if I'm increasingly conscious of my Islamic identity, China now becomes more of an issue and a problem for me when I think about foreign policy, particularly given China's record with the Uyghurs. But if I'm a voter in Sulawesi, I may not know anything about that. So in, any spillover? Yeah, any, any sense of how the Uyghur issue is playing or not playing in Indonesia? It's becoming yep. much stronger, okay? So this notion that Islam requires Muslims to come to the aid of their brethren when they're being attacked particularly by non-Muslims has always been strong, right, in Indonesia. That's why the Palestinian issue is such a key one. It's a domestic political issue. Um, and this is one of the few issues, right, support for Muslim communities abroad that are being repressed that you really do see public opinion as a kind of bottom-up pressure on the government, which, as um, Adam notes, uh, with the Rohingya issue, that's one of the reasons that uh, Foreign Minister Masudi really had to take um, such a big role on that. 
um, because she was pressed until mm -hmm. you had all of the really horrific displacement uh, over the last few years. Mm -hmm. Yudo Yono, earlier in his term, would say, oh, you know, Myanmar's transitioning to democracy. We had our sectarian violence. It's not a big issue. But with the explicit targeting of the Rohingya, it's a completely different scenario. You've also seen it with the Uyghurs. That's playing. Um, it's becoming a much greater focus. It has not. And it's been, it was used against Joe Gowie in the campaign, right? You're cozying up to China for money. You're not protecting the Uyghurs. Adam, I don't know if you want to respond to that, but I might pile Third, on another uh, question, which is, okay. um, in, in addition to how the Uyghur issue is playing in Indonesia, we of course know that the Muslim ban, and even much more prominently, the, the, the US, the Trump administration's decision to move the embassy uh, um, um, uh, to Jerusalem triggered the largest protest in yeah. Indonesian history. So is there sort of an imbalance there, or are, the, are both uh, dynamics at play? In I terms think, the, of listen, the Palestine issue is, 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 a, is a very sensitive one for Indonesia. It's, uh, they've always been very, very strong on that. Um, I, 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 again, I <laughs> keep it to my role. I, I disagree <laughs> a little bit with Anne-Marie. I, I, I kind of expected the Uyghur issue to come up. It's sort of an obvious stick for the Islamic groups behind Prabowo to use against Jokowi, um, in particular because they're largely anti-Chinese as well. Um, they largely didn't. I mean, it was a peripheral issue. Uh, it didn't really come up in the, in the one provincial debate that was, supposed, that was on foreign policy. Um, to your point, it's just not something, I mean, Indonesia is, is sort of like a lot of big nations, it's, it's largely inward looking. Um, there isn't a lot of, 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 of coverage and interest in, in, in the outside world, including the Uyghur issue, even, even the Rohingya issue is limited to a sort of a fairly small minority. Um, Amy made the point that I was going to make was that, you know, just because of, you know, the news and how it works, probably far more Indonesians are aware of, you know, um, the U.S. ban on, you know, the Muslim ban than they are of the Uyghur issue. And just from a, a pragmatic point of view, to throw another sort of log on the fire, as angry as, as, as Indonesians were about the U.S. decision to move the embassy in, uh, in Israel, and angry as they were with Australia to support that move, it did not stop them from signing a you know, very wide-ranging economic partnership agreement with Australia a month ago. So, I mean, I, again, I, 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 then we Australia always have to keep the stuff in, 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 in uh, was that? I thought, I thought uh, Prime Minister Morrison had to sort of walk back Australia's position on the embassy before they... Well, they've got a balance between sort of Indonesia and the U.S. He walked it back a little bit, but yeah. I, I think the, their policy is still there supportive. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one more question here, Liv. Uh, thank you. Lex Riefa with the Brookings Institution. Uh, I'm sort of in, it's surprising to me that there are three, I think, of big issues that were not touched on at all in your conversation. And the first is uh, the role of the military, TNE, which it seems to me is still benefiting from off-budget resources to a certain, to a significant amount. Second issue is climate change and whether Indonesia is sort of contributing, uh, help, is being helpful or unhelpful on this global issue. Mm -hmm. And third is youth employment or youth unemployment, which could be uh, sort of a major problem, challenge. Very quickly, mm -hmm. um, the, the military's access to off-budget resources is actually considerably less than, than, than it was. Um, if you judge by sort of how loudly the military is complaining about it. Um, what, one of, you may have seen that there's been a lot of controversy over Jacoby's idea of moving a thousand or two active military people into civil service roles. Um, is, 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 I mean, there's a couple of, of motivations behind that. It's got a lot of pushback, you know, return of Dewey Funksy and that kind of thing. But part of the motivation is because these, these people need jobs and they, and, they, and they don't have the access to the off-budget resources that, uh, that they once had. Uh, climate change, uh, Indonesia has sort of gone from uh, a very sort of public engagement with the global climate change challenge under SBY, who was engaged with it, to, again, more typically to a, a, a Jokowi style, much more industry specific and, and how this is going to work on the ground. But the reality is that the, pro you know, if you just look at, not the rhetoric, but the actions, is that uh, Indonesia has 
has done much more on the ground to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions in the last four or five years than it did in the 10 years under SBY, largely because the structure of Indonesia's GHG emissions are unusually um, situated in one sector, whereas most countries are, it's diverse, but in Indonesia's mm -hmm. case, two thirds are land use change and deforestation. Mm -hmm. So by stop by banning the use, giving out new forest licenses for palm oil and banning the existing palm oil companies from cultivating palm oil on peat land, um, is actually done more to sort of attack the mm -hmm. actual problem than a lot of SBY's speeches mm -hmm. at uh, various COP meetings have done. Mm -hmm. Youth mm -hmm. unemployment is a massive problem. Um, it's probably in the order of 35% underemployment. There are two and a half million people coming into the workforce every year. The educational system is not educating people coming out of universities to sort of be particularly effective in the economy that Indonesia is becoming. So that whole educational, vocational skills training is a, is a massive challenge for Indonesia. And I think you'll see that's one of the major focus areas of Jokowi in his second term. Anne-Marie, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, the only thing I would add is that part of Jokowi's use of the military um, and trying to move some in is, number one, they have a way that the military expands. So you have all of these folks at certain levels. Um, and there's no promotion for them, so they're trying to find new avenues. But also, the military often gets things done. So Joko We has been relying on them to help with certain infrastructure projects, particularly in a place like Papua, um, where you don't have a lot of other alternatives. So that is also part of that motivation mm -hmm. there. Well, um, just to add very briefly to that point, mm -hmm. it's not just in Papua. I think Jokowi also feels that there's a whole bunch of director generals and directors who aren't doing their job properly that he could possibly count on the military to, to do faster and more yeah. efficiently. Absolutely. And to end on the youth note, which I think is really important, I mean, it's, we always have to remember that 40% of Indonesia is under 25, and the electorate this time, 40% uh, was between 17 and 35. So. The youth vote uh, and, the, and kind of you know, young people engaged in Indonesian politics is going to be an increasingly important factor going forward. Um, okay, well, we are out of time, so please join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you.